morning, everybody. Good morning. Praise the Lord. It's good to be together in the house of the Lord, isn't it? Amen. Well, I want to preach to you this morning, and uh, I have to say it wouldn't have been my choice. Had it been left to me, I would have spoken on the parable of the sower. But it wasn't to be. I had the conviction that I'd got to preach from Revelation. And um, it just wouldn't go away. Um, And I believe it is of God because, you know, the songs that we've sung this morning, most of them come from the book of Revelation. That's where their inspiration (coughs) was found. Worthy is the Lamb seated on the throne. Crown you now with many crowns. You reign victorious, high and lifted up. Jesus, Son of God, the treasure of heaven crucified. Worthy is the Lamb. I'd like to read to you initially from the book of Revelation chapter 1. And we'll start at uh, chapter 1, verse 11. (coughs) Perhaps verse 10. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice, as of a trumpet, saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. What you see, write in a book, and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus and unto Smyrna, and unto Pergamos, and unto Thyatira, and unto Sardis, and unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. And I turned to see the voice that spoke with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden la- candlesticks, or lampstands. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment, down to the foot, and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire, and his feet like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, And his countenance was like the sun, shining in his strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. Write the things which you have seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. The mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand, and the seven golden lampstands. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven candlesticks which you saw are the seven churches. Now will you turn over please? This is a picture of the risen, glorified Christ, no longer the crucified Jesus who was resurrected by God the Father and still had the visible wounds in his hands and his side and in his feet. But this is the glorified Christ now. And it's the glorified Christ who comes to his church. Remember that. It's not gentle Jesus, meek and mild. He still has the same spirit. Hallelujah. I'm grateful for that. Still the same spirit. Still still the same Jesus, but glorified. So I want you to turn over to Revelation chapter 3. And the title of my message is this, 
a call to the church in these last days, a call to the church in these last days. So we'll read from Revelation chapter 3. And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans, verse 14, these things says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I would you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm, I will spew you or vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. And know not that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I counsel you to buy of me gold tried in the fire that you may be rich. And white raiment, white clothing that you may be clothed. And that the shame of your nakedness do not appear. And anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. To him that overcomes will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my Father in his throne. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. And in chapter 4, verse 1, we read this, After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven. What we read in Chapter 1 was this, write the things which you have seen and the things which are and the things which shall be hereafter. It's significant, you know, that at the beginning of uh, chapter 4, it says a door was opened in heaven. John had a vision of things which will be hereafter. Now, just before he had that vision, he saw... And God gave him a revelation of the church and its true condition, the church in Laodicea. Interesting, isn't it? Now, you don't need to be <coughs> too discerning to realize and acknowledge and own up to the fact that the church in today's age is as insipid and weak as that that's described in Laodicea. Now, it's not true of all churches, in the West particularly, but certainly there's a lot of churches in the UK, in America, where this message applies. So, I've only got five points to bring to you, and I promise we'll be through by two o'clock. And they all begin with P, okay? They all begin with P. First the place, then the portrait, then the problem, then the prescription, and finally the promise. I'm so glad that God ends his word to this church with a promise, an encouragement. Yes, he, he tells it like it is. And you know, sometimes we ha have to face up to reality and acknowledge the truth. Because then, the promise can finally be applied. That's God's ultimate desire. So first of all, the place. And I want to ask you to stick with me, please. Stick with me. You know, sometimes... Preachers can be a bit tedious, can't, can't we? Can't I? Please stick with me. 
Okay, please stick with me because we'll gain the fruit of it as we go through this brief passage. Okay, stick with me. Laodicea. Now, it was a prosperous city. It was at a major crossroads, one that went east to west or west to east and one that went north to south. There was Laodicea. And in consequence, there was a lot of traffic. All the HGVs and everything else used Laodicea as a a terminus. And all the big bankers went to Laodicea. It was a center for banking and commerce. It was also a large farming center. It had a huge trade in black sheep from which they produced glossy black wool which featured in their clothing. Black clothing, got it? In AD 60, there was a huge natural disaster. We've seen and heard of two huge natural disasters only in the last week or two, the like of which I cannot get my mind around. The floods in Texas, one of the richest states in the U.S., of A. Over 9 million people have been displaced. Did you know that? 9 million. I believe it's over twice the population of Wales, certainly New Zealand. Give you some idea of it. President Trump has gone cap in hand to Congress asking for over $7 billion. Can you get your mind around that? Over seven million quid as a down payment to start the reparation work and help those people who've been devastated by it. In Southeast Asia, the floods there are unprecedented and over 40 million. Can you get your mind around that? 40 million people have been displaced. Let's go back to Texas for a minute. President Trump is asking Congress for $7 billion. Now, Laodicea had a huge natural disaster in AD 60. A massive earthquake devastated the city. And Nero, the emperor, offered them reparation money. And do you know what? They declined it. They funded all their reparation work themselves. Can you imagine? Just think in modern terms about Texas. Now, we comparatively are rich. The tragedy is for this nation that most of it is funded by debt of massive proportions. But Laodicea was such a prosperous place that it was able to fund its own reparation work. That's how rich it was. Get your mind around that. In a modern context, Texas can't afford to do it. Impossible. But Laodicea could. The one drawback of Laodicea is that it lacked a permanent, ready supply of water. (coughs) Now, just up the road at Hierapolis, which actually, I understand, I've never been there, but you can look across the valley and you can see Hierapolis in the distance. So those that have been there tell me. At Hierapolis, there were hot springs. Okay, hot springs. Jolly good for medicinal purposes and for making a nice cup of tea if they had tea in those days. Down the road at Colossae, they had an ice-cold water supply, lovely in the hot climate in which they lived. 
Oh, you'd go out in the rising sun and soon get very hot. Oh, for a glass of ice-cold water that got it in abundance at Colossae. So what they did in Laodicea was pipe down from Hyapolis a supply of water from the hot springs. The problem was, by the time it got to Laodicea, it was lukewarm and tepid. And the only thing it was really good for in its natural state was to be an emetic. Now, I had to look that word up when I read it. Those of you who are medical will know that it means it makes you vomit. Right? That was the natural supply of water. You're getting the picture of Laodicea. Naturally speaking, are you? That was the place. The next thing we come to is the portrait. The portrait of the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember, we're talking about the glorified Christ here. Coming to his church in Laodicea. And this is what the Lord Jesus says of himself. I am the Amen. This, these things says the Amen. In Deuteronomy chapter 7 and verse 9, you get this thought there too, 7 and verse 9. Know therefore that the Lord your God, he is God, the faithful God, which keeps covenant and mercy with them that love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations, not just for two generations or four or six, but a thousand generations. Now, that word faithful God, the faithful God, is really the Amen God. The Amen God. You can trust what he says and what he says he'll follow through on. Hallelujah. Do you know? <clears throat> amen. The Amen. Get that word in your soul. In John's Gospel, 25 times, Jesus says, Verily, verily. Now in the NIV, it says, I tell you the truth. And I'm sorry, but sometimes the Word of God doesn't express itself. God doesn't express himself colloquially. <clears throat> verily, verily. What that word really is, is, Amen. Amen. Exactly the same word that Jesus revealed himself by <coughs> in to the Laodiceans, the Amen. Amen. First time that Jesus said it was to Nicodemus, and he said, Verily, verily, Amen. Amen, I say unto you, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Can I ask you this morning, are you born again? It was Jesus Christ himself who said, it's a requirement to come into the kingdom of God, to be born again. It's certain, it's sure, the word can be trusted. 25 times throughout John's Gospel, Jesus said, Amen, Amen. John 5, 24, just one or two for example. Amen, Amen, I say unto you, he that hears my word and believes on him that sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. Hallelujah. We can depend upon the word 
of the Amen God. Hallelujah. Aren't you glad? Aren't you glad? He's the faithful and true witness. That reminds us of what John, the Apostle John, had said before in chapter 1. And from Jesus Christ, John to the seven churches from Asia, verse 5, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness. The faithful and true witness. That word witness is really, the Greek word is martus. Okay? Now we get the word martyr from it. The Lord Jesus Christ is the faithful and true martyr. I made a note of what one of the commentators says about this. He's one who bears witness by his death. Jesus faithfully proclaimed God to this world, preserving through suffering and even to his death. Sorry, persevering, can't read my own writing, through suffering and even to his death on the cross. His testimony was 100% true and faithful to his calling. In this, he is an example to the Laodicean church who are not being faithful or true to their calling. Jesus also said, he is the beginning of the creation of God. Now the true meaning of that expression is that he is the origin and the beginning and the author of God's creation. This is the one who is speaking to the Laodicean church. This is the one who's speaking to the church today. The origin and beginning and author of God's creation. If you read Proverbs chapter 8 from verse 22 onwards, you get a fuller reflection of exactly what Jesus was doing. It's described as wisdom. It's an attribute of the Lord Jesus Christ. So that's a portrait, just a, a tiny little portrait of the risen Christ and attributes which he chose to speak and reveal himself through to the church at Laodicea and the church in the last days. What about the problem? The problem, Jesus says, is that they're neither cold nor hot. Question, does that describe my spiritual state this morning? Ask yourself that question. Lukewarm. Just like Laodicea's natural water supply. And Jesus says, it's interesting, he doesn't say to Laodicea that they're dead. He does to another church, not too far away, to Sardis. He says they're dead. You have a name that you're alive, but you're dead. But it, isn't it interesting that the thing that seems to be mo most objectionable to the Lord Jesus is lukewarmness, apathy. I'll vomit you out of my mouth. You have a drink, you get um, uh, uh, a jar or a cup, and you have some of Laodicea's water, and you drink it, and you will vomit. That's exactly what Jesus says he will do to his church in Laodicea. That's how objectionable and unacceptable his people are. He's talking about his people 
incredible, isn't it? The problem. <clears throat> and this is what they say. Interesting, they're a saying church. I know your works, that you're neither cold nor hot. Because you say, I am rich, I am increased with goods, I have need of nothing. What they'd really done, they'd gained the wrong kind of wealth, they'd made the wrong kind of investments, and the result, the product was arrogance which God hates, self-sufficiency, I have need of nothing. Incidentally, if you go to a Christian bookshop, doesn't matter which variety it is, St. Andrews if you can find one, CLC if you go, and look at the bookshelves and the subjects they cover, you'll find a vast number of books about self-help. And you'll find very few about missions. <sighs> Doesn't that say a lot about the church today, of which I'm a part, and you too? Now listen to Jesus' estimate of these people. You don't know that you're wretched. Let's just look at these words. I've, made, I've looked them up. Wretched. It means that their true condition was that they were in hardship, suffering, and distress. That's how the Lord saw them. Wretched. Miserable. Listen to this. It means... One who has the means available to relieve his pain, but chooses not to take advantage of it. In other words, they, they knew. They knew. They'd got the means available. They'd got all the power in Jesus Christ. But they chose not to avail themselves of it. They were poor, said Jesus, as a cringing beggar, a pauper, poverty stricken, absolutely powerless to enrich. And yet they were materially rich. They were blind and they were naked. Interesting, isn't it? What the glorified Christ is saying is that everything in Laodicean society is found in his church. I'm glad that Jesus doesn't leave it there. Okay, so that's the problem. Quite a big problem, isn't it? Naturally speaking, there's no solution to it. It's no good them going to the bank. It's no good to them going to their NHS, being referred to the mental health services, and we need them. I don't despise them. And asking for counselling, it's the wrong kind of counselling for the church in Laodicea. You know, counselling can be very good and very positive. But oh no, there's no solution. There's no prescription except that which the Lord Jesus provides. And he says, I counsel you to buy of me gold tried in the fire that you may be rich and white raiment that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness does not appear, 
and anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. One thing I forgot to mention about Laodicea is that it was a noted medical center. And if you'd got any eye problems and you lived in that vicinity, you would go to Laodicea. That's where they'd refer you for treatment because they could cure you. They had an eye ointment. That's why Jesus says, anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. There was a lack of love, a lack of power, and a lack of prayer in the church in Laodicea. But the prescription that Jesus came with offered them three things which they hadn't got and they could have in abundance. The first one was vibrant faith. We'll look at that in a little bit of detail. Dazzling purity and enlightened vision. Vibrant faith. That's the kind of attributes which I want, don't you? Vibrant faith. Dazzling purity. An enlightened vision. I counsel thee to buy of me. You know that word buy... I, it's amazing when you look at Scripture and look at the detail of it. It is absolutely incredible. Let me read to you what it says about that word for buy in the Greek. It says this. I'll give you the word. It's agoradzo. And it means to be in the marketplace. Okay? To do business there. So Jesus comes right down and uses terms that they in the church in Laodicea will understand because that's the currency that they traded in. They were rich and increased with goods. They'd accumulated wealth. They felt they'd made the right investments to do business there. The word is used here in the sense of doing business with God on his terms. Man sold himself a slave to sin and Satan. God paid the price of his redemption. Man is now obligated to meet God's terms of faith, repentance and service if he wants to be redeemed. The word is not used here of man actually paying a price in money, goods, exchanging material things for the gold, raiment and ointment of verse 18, but rather of his paying the price of renouncing Satan, repenting of sins, and consecrating to God in the face of suffering persecution such as Christians must suffer for Christ. It's part of the package, brothers and sisters. It's part of the package, and it's a message which the church has neglected and forgotten and put on the back burner. But Jesus said, in the world you'll have tribulation. It's part of the package, it's inescapable if you're going to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. In the world, you'll have trouble. You'll have the tribulum, which was, it was a, a many, many tailed whip. And if you came under the tribulum, you knew about it. But Jesus says, Be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. In one of his epistles, Paul says, All that live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. All, 
No exceptions. All. Revelation chapter 3, it speaks of gold tried in the fire that you may be rich. 1 Peter 1 verse 7, I must read it to you because it's so relevant that the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perishes, though it be tried with fire. You get the repetition. Might be fain, found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. You see, brothers and sisters, if our faith cannot be tested by persecution and by suffering, it's not really faith. That's the scriptural definition of faith. Now, it's not something we look for, but it's something that in Jesus Christ we can inherit and enjoy. Vibrant faith. Dazzling purity. You know, he talks about a white garment. And this is essential for every believer in Jesus Christ because it's the only thing you're going to carry into eternity. He wants us to wear a dazzling white garment now. Because when we're translated by death or taken up by the Spirit, we'll still be wearing it when we're standing before the Lord, if we're standing beyond our faces. Dazzling purity. Now, purity is something, really, which, again, the church today fights shy of. It wants to be inclusive. The world wants to be inclusive. If you want a white garment, there's a price to pay. <clears throat> and I would I'll say this. If you are engaged in any kind of sexual activity that's outside the holy bond of marriage between a man and a woman, it is sin. And your garment, your white garment, will be stained, it will be spotted. And sin has no place for the believer. If we're clothed in white garments, we go God's way, or it's no way. So if you are engaged in any kind of sinful practice, get out of it. Get out of it. You're talking about something that will affect your eternal destiny and your eternal welfare. But his desire is that we have a garment that's white and reflects dazzling purity. Now remember, the natural garments they wore in Laodicea were black. But Jesus sees his church. Maybe, maybe you know. They're still wearing black garments, but they're dazzling white in spiritual terms. We'll get to that in a minute. I've nearly finished, although I'm, I'm excited about this. Aren't you? Does it really matter if our, our Sunday lunch is a bit screwed up and burnt up? Eh? What lunch? There we go. There we go. Praise the Lord. The prescription may not be pleasant, but oh, the outcome of it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. As many as I love. that Now, I'm sorry, I've missed out enlightened vision. You know, anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. This represents enlightenment by the Holy Spirit and the Word of God. He's indispensable. You know, you can't put the Holy Spirit out and behind. He's indispensable. 
If you want revelation from the Word of God, you need the Holy Spirit. Are you filled with Him? Are you? Have you been filled this morning? Have you gone back for a recharge? Hey, eh? They tell us by the time they've got rid of all the petrol and diesel cars, we'll need about 25 million electric charging points. We'll need power stations dotted here, there and everywhere to be able to charge them readily. Otherwise they won't go. We won't go without the Holy Spirit. Oh, you might be able to pootle along for up to 100 miles. That's the typical range. Then it'll peter out. Nothing. You need to be connected to the Lord Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit. You need your eyes anointed with eye salve Enlightened by the Word of God. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Right, the promise. You thought I'd never get there. No, I'm sorry, I've missed out verse 19. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. As many as I love, I re- You know, he loves us. He loves us so much, he won't leave us alone. Thank you, Lord. <coughs> Pastor was telling me that he spoke on the book of Jonah last weekend. Well, I, I don't think it was to the folk here, was it? It was to the Korean church. Well, I was thinking about bringing Jonah. <laughs> but praise God, he steered me, steered me elsewhere. But you know, Jonah, the word of the Lord came the second time to Jonah. I'm glad he's the God of the second time and the third time and the fourth time and the fifth time. Hallelujah. Now the promise. You thought I'd never get there. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Jesus is knocking. This is the risen, glorified Lord Jesus Christ. It's his church. I will build my church. And yet he's standing outside the door and knocking. What a gracious God. What incredible grace. Doesn't force his way. But he's not only knocking, he's calling as well. If any man hear my voice, he's not content to use one means. He wants to use every means to get our attention. Not just to knock, but to speak, to whisper words of love. Let me in. Jesus is tenderly calling. Is tenderly calling today. Are you listening for him? Are you listening to him? You throw the door wide open and let him in to his church. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will eat with him, says the NIV, sup with him, says the King James, and he with me. But eat with me, it's the main meal of the day, you know. Now we were invited out a little while ago, for the main meal of the day with some friends. And we got there about 6.30, and we went home, getting on for 10 o'clock. We had to be home by 10, because if we're not home by 10, we turn into pumpkins. But it's several hours of eating and fellowshipping together. And that's what Jesus desires. Fellowship, communion with his people. You notice the promise. You read about revivals and you find that wherever God is abroad at work, he calls his people to prayer. It may only be one or two. And they agonize in prayer. Agonize. So that they might see his face. This is the only time 
that I know of in Scripture, correct me if I'm wrong afterwards, where he promises, assures his people, if you open the door, I will come in. I will eat with you and you with me. What a promise. But it doesn't only stop there. Get this. To him that overcomes will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my Father in his throne. That's incredible. Do you know? Do you remember James and John, the sons of thunder? They said to Jesus, Lord, grant to us that we'll sit one on your right hand, one on your left hand, when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said, no, it's not for me. But here he is, promising his church in Laodicea that if we overcome, if we invite him in, fellowship and commune with him, get right with him, that we'll sit with him in his throne. That is absolutely incredible. Have you heard the word of the Lord this morning? It's a word to you and it's a word to me. I close with this amusing episode. Jenny and I were stood in the queue for the checkout baskets a week ago. We were the next in line. And a gentleman comes up with a newspaper in his hands and he says, are you standing in the queue? To which we both responded, yes. He walked straight past us and as he walked past us, one of the checkouts which were all occupied was vacated and he took up the vacant slot. We looked at each other amazed. I observed this gentleman And he gave the assistant a £20 note to pay for his newspaper. Just as he did so, the checkout next to him became vacant, so we walked up to him. And I was listening, I was observing what was going on. And there was a little bit of converse between them, which I didn't hear. But his concluding comment, I did hear. And as she was giving him his change... I could see she was quite aghast and upset. And he said, your trouble is that you don't listen to what people are saying. Well, when I related this to Jenny, we both fell about laughing. Have you heard the word of the Lord this morning? Because it demands a response from your heart and from mine. Amen. Let's just pray for a moment. Father, we want to thank you for your word. We praise you, Lord, that it cuts us to the quick. But we praise you also that you offer us such lovely, lovely promises, Lord, which we can take ownership of by your grace and because the Amen has said them. Lord, we ask that you'll enable us just to yield to your wooing and to let Jesus reign in our hearts today. For your name's sake. Amen. 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 Praise God. Thank you for your ministry this morning.